I mentioned, uh, I mentioned before the break the number of calls coming in. We appreciate you uh, callers and appreciate your patience as we take a little time to get to them. But I promise this segment we will get to your phone calls as we talk with D Dr. David Aronoff, uh, the director of the Division of Infectious Di Diseases over at Vanderbilt. Let's get right to Mike. Welcome to Open Line, Mike. Good evening, uh, uh, Rory, and uh, good evening to the uh, doctor who's been uh, doing an amazing job during this whole pandemic, as well as some of the other medical uh, doctors, uh, over Meharry as well, and uh, doing our, uh, our local clinics. But anyway, I first want to give kudos to the Acme Agency for the steps they've taken. Uh, they've uh, in, uh, implemented new air filtration systems. They decided this week to close down again because they saw the numbers spiking. That's what we need more of within responsible businesses. First of all, second of all, I'd like to see Governor Lee has failed the lives of Tennesseans by being gutless and not taking the steps needed. And uh, governors like that are responsible, just like DeSantos in Florida, for this upsurge. Uh, today they had riots in Northern Italy due to the uh, uprising and the deaths again. And uh, Italy had gone from 900 deaths a day down to nine deaths a day. And now, because people have gotten relaxed, that has gone up. For people who think we're trying to implement our policies on them, this is like why we stopped having smoking in buildings and restaurants. You do have a right to smoke and, and, and take a risk of infecting your lungs with cancer, but you don't have a right in that same uh, space mm -hmm. to right. infect me with your cancerous uh, habits right. or my family. And so I put it down to three things. This whole thing is about money, number two, liberty, and three, politics. And we're going to have to decide to be more, uh, put more thought toward humanity than anything else over money. And I think we're gonna probably be wearing masks the same time next year. And I wanna see what the doctor yeah. thinks about that. Real quick, so thank, Mike, thank real you quick. For your call. Mike, mm -hmm. let me jump in and ask you before we get to this. Um, Okay. We have uh, the government, and I'm not uh, trying to be political at all here, but from presidents, governors, mm -hmm. mayors, um, from the beginning, uh, we looked at this and, and ramped up development of PPE, and uh, try, we're getting a vaccine as fast as possible, but we know that takes a lot of time with trials, therapeutics, doctors mm -hmm. and researchers working nonstop, treating patients, learning as we've discussed. At what point do you think it, it no longer matters what a, a governor or a mayor says or does, it comes down to personal responsibility. Where, where are we with that, do you think, Mike? Well, once again, it, it is personal responsibility. It's yeah. people who think they're immune to this disease when they really are not. They may have the immunity to not get a full-blown uh, coronavirus, but just test positive, but they go back to visit grandma right. or mother and dad and then their immune system, mm -hmm. they're older, they may have right. some underlying health conditions, and they put them in a predicament. It's about selflessness. I hate to say it, but we as a people have become so selfless and so entitled that we think we have a right to be flagrant about wearing a stupid, silly mask. It's not that we're asking you to cut your hand off. Yeah. Uh, we're just asking you to wear a mask. Be creative about it. It's not that bad. And yeah. uh, we could, if we do it, we wouldn't be in the position that we are today if we had to stay in phase one. And that's how I feel. Mike, thanks so much. We appreciate it. Doctor? Yeah, well, I really appreciate Mike calling. And, uh, you know, I agree with, with him that uh, healthcare workers around the state are doing everything possible to help with this. And our partners across town at Meharry are doing an amazing job and really also helping with a lot of testing. Um, and, and we know that masks work. I like the analogy to smoking. Uh, you know, re now people uh, understand when they go into a restaurant, they just can't light up a cigarette, that, that it's okay to have a no smoking restaurant and they have to take it outside because that smoke could be dangerous to others in the right. restaurant. Well, now we're in a situation where my breath could quite literally be lethal to somebody else. And so having these sort of guidance uh, rules to help us understand the importance of engaging in public health is important. And, you know, we don't let individuals decide on their own speed limit in different roads. We, we really do depend on our government creating laws that help us function as a mm -hmm. society and as a community. And public health 
falls into that area where we really do rely on the government helping us understand what vaccines should we be using? How should we be allocating resources? What sort of things are right. important? Drunk driving laws, all of these things. And so masks go into that. And, and I, I would like to see more leading by example and more right. uh, top down approach to helping us handle this pandemic. He mentioned uh, the honky tonk Acme Feed and Seed. They've been very conservative with how they have reopened uh, the owner there, um, shutting down again just because he didn't like what he was seeing down on lower broadway and you know businesses like that they're hurting there's a lot of employees there who are who are not working which brings up the other side some people argue that you know obviously shutdowns partial shutdowns or or larger shutdowns like we're seeing in europe um yes they they can help contain uh and s slow the spread of this virus but people are concerned about the long-term health impacts of economic recessions and uh, even depression uh, of what it does to the health of people who are not working. How do we balance this? Yeah, I mean, this is really, really important. And I think it's important to understand, first of all, that the pandemic itself is creating a lot of mental health stresses and physical health stresses, and it's already keeping people apart. Um, you know, it's been a devastating pandemic not only for the direct effects of the virus mm -hmm. on people, but on our ability to interact and keep the economy going and to keep schools going. So no question, this is a really, really difficult time that's requiring a lot of sacrifices. I've been really honored to be working with the Nashville Visitors and Convention Corps, Ryman Hospitality Partners as well to develop the Good To Go program that a lot of businesses have been participating yeah. in sort of helps all of these businesses um, understand all the different guidance to keep their employees and customers safe. And in meeting with business owners and employees through this time, I know it's really, really hard. And I am so thankful for everybody who's showing leadership, doing the things that need to be done to keep us safe during this time. Yeah. And understanding that the economics of this is really, um, really, really, really hard. Let's go to Tina next. Hi, Tina. Welcome to Open Line. Tina, you there? Yes. Hi. Go ahead. What's on your mind? So I drive for special needs. I'm a bus driver, so okay. and a lot of a lot of the kids don't have their mask on. So what else? I reinforce that a lot. And can I ventilate the bus? Would that help me out? I'm not sure what else I can do because, you know, it's constantly, I have to get up and put how, on the how many How many kids are we talking? And I assume you're wearing a mask at the time. I'm wearing a mask yeah. as well. And, and um, right now we only have five kids on the bus. Okay. So ventilation, air conditioning, windows open. Doctor, what do you think? Yeah, it's Tina, first of all, thank you for what you do. Um, and uh, thank you for calling. Um, it's a tricky situation and it, it, it's one that may differ for every vehicle that's being used to transport people, children, adults. Um, I think there are things that we can do to stack the cards in our favor to reduce the risk of transmission. One of those is reducing the density of passengers on the bus. And, and so five may be a low density based on the size of the bus keeping people socially distanced on the bus, making sure that the children who, or special needs adults who are on the bus are not symptomatic, not having fever. Um, and then yes, to the extent when possible, keeping some windows open so that air is moving and fresh air is coming in is helpful. Trying to make sure that there's ways to keep the route as short as possible and, and for um, keeping people from staying on the bus for too long. But, um, you know, it's impossible to get the risks down to zero with almost anything that we do, but it sounds like you're thinking about all the right mm -hmm. things. And, and again, I'm very appreciative for the work that you do. Thank you, Tina. Let's go to Rocky next. Rocky, welcome to Open Line. Rocky there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, uh, I've been kind of weighing this out there. Uh, from what I'm seeing, <laughs> Uh, it started in the big cities, a lot of population. It's spreading out to the outer rural areas now from where I live. Uh, 
way I'm saying it, you can wear a mask, I, and I'm not trying to, and I hate it for the people that's got underlying conditions, I understand that, but I know a couple people that wore masks, have wore mask gloves, stayed at home, and they still ended up with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I'm saying, it's kind of like a flat tar. It's a, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, and it depends on your health conditions, you know, how far you're going to take it. Uh, and I'll, I'm going to throw this in there. I've always voted Democrat. Mm-hmm. But when I see the mayor, when this all started, having rallies and all this, and this comes back to the mask wearing thing, you've got all the protests, and they're not making people wear masks, not going in and shutting them down. But yet, you're, they're demanding, or everybody's wanting to demand, you know, hey, everybody needs to wear a mask. I'm just kind of bomb-foozled about how that's working, and yeah. I won't leave it at that. Yeah, that was, okay, thank you. That was early on when we had those protests. Uh, I want to go back to something he said, doctor, though, about uh, people with underlying conditions. We obviously know now that there are specific populations. Uh, compromised immune systems, the elderly definitely hit harder and more vulnerable. Yeah, that's exactly right. And, and, you know, the, the virus um, tends to cause more severe disease in older adults. And certainly when we look at mortality or hospitalizations, it tends to be in older adults as we get above 60, 70, 80. The, the risk of death really, really goes up. But we're also seeing younger people who are getting very sick with this. And they often have very common medical conditions, high blood pressure, for example, diabetes, being overweight or obese turns out to be a risk factor for doing poorly with COVID-19. And then some people who may have minimal or no risk factors uh, are more likely to get infected. Just maybe they live in more crowded conditions or they are social with other people. And so even though relatively young people are one of the largest shares of people who are getting infected and tend to do well, if enough young people get infected, you start to see those small percentages of them really badly. And so in our hospital, we regularly will have young people struggling to live uh, due to infection from COVID-19. Want to get in one more phone call before the next break, and that's Bill. Hi, Bill. Welcome. Yes, my name is Bill. Thank you for taking my call. Sure. Doctor, I'd like to ask a question. I'm going to have surgery next month. Uh, elective surgery and everything, and you're saying about blood clots and all. I'm taking Zeralto, and they're going to put me on Lovinox to take the Zeralto away during the surgery and everything. Is there? I mean, elective surgeries. Is it? You know, are they? You know, as I put it, are they safe? So to, you know, concerned about your, your your safety with that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot that's going on with the blood clotting and COVID-19. I would certainly encourage you to speak with your licensed healthcare professional about the surgery, whether given that it's elective, whether it may need to be postponed based on disease activity. It may be that the facility where you're having the surgery is actually not gonna be doing elective surgeries depending on what's going on with disease activity. We certainly saw earlier in the pandemic that many places stopped doing elective surgeries, but have a conversation with your physician or other Mm -hmm. licensed healthcare professional about your concerns with the medicine that you're on for anticoagulation. I'm an infectious disease expert. If you had questions about antibiotics, I could help you, but specific blood clot prevention medications, I'll leave that up to the folks who are prescribing that to you, and I appreciate that question. And that's a good point about elective surgery, doctor. We know a couple of of, um, hospitals right now with the surge in in cases and patients have have stopped elective surgeries for now uh, just because they want to make sure they have the bed space, right? That's exactly right. You know, the concern is that every winter we tend to get more people in the hospital anyway, so bed availability tends to shrink as we head into cold and flu and pneumonia season. And so now that we're seeing more hospitalizations from COVID-19, we really do wanna be in a situation where we have enough beds to take care of people who may not have COVID-19, but absolutely need to be in the hospital. With that, we'll take another break and more of your phone calls on Open Line when we come back.